What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so I originally didn't have any videos scheduled for Thursday, and I was like, man, I need a video to come out today, like, just for the sake of having something out. <laughs> and the more I started thinking about it, the more I was like, well, Infinite Crisis, like, we're going to be getting into Infinite Crisis here in the next couple of weeks or so. And so I was like, I mean, if that's going to be part of our whole Green Lantern run, and, like, Superboy Prime was, like, a huge part of Infinite Crisis, probably, like, the best part of Infinite Crisis, then why not do the origin of Superboy Prime? The problem was trying to find it, like... <laughs> <laughs> the the original origin of Superboy Prime is like it's like the most difficult thing to find ever in the history of DC Comics. It's crazy. But we found it. We have the origin of Superboy Prime, the very first origin uh, written by Elliot S. Magan. Now, what we're going to do with this is we're actually just going to kind of roll this into our Green Lantern playlist. We're going to kind of just throw it in there just because of the fact that understanding the origin of Superboy Prime, I really think goes towards like what makes him such an identifiable character, what makes him so interesting in Infinite Crisis, like why he's doing what he's doing. But this also kind of gives us a little bit of a precursor and really kind of ties in to Crisis on Infinite Earths. The problem with this was that this was really like an afterthought for Crisis on Infinite Earths. So it kind of fits in, but it kind of doesn't. It's really just kind of shoehorned in there. But because we're not talking about Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, we're talking about Infinite Crisis, we can just kind of take the story as it is. Now, there are a few differences here from the traditional Superman landscape. And one thing that I want to point out is what Earth Prime is. So in the realm of, of DC Comics, and even in the realm of Marvel Comics, we have what's basically the real world. Now, they're really the only two publishers who do this. And the reason why is because Valiant comics, for example, just uses the real world. I mean, it's really just kind of like our world for the most part, the world outside your window. What would the world look like if Exo Man of War were running around right now? So uh, that really kind of hits home with like the, the nature of their stories. But Marvel and DC focus on like the superhero world. What Earth Prime does, and Earth Prime has been around, I think since the 1950s, what Earth Prime does is it basically gives us the real world in comic book form. The first time we really saw this, I think it was The Flash. I think it was Barry Allen who crossed over into Earth Prime by accident, but it was really kind of an interesting thing. But in in the realm of Earth Prime, Superboy is the only superhero that exists there. There are no other superheroes. There's no Green Lantern, there's no Flash, no Wonder Woman, none of that. Superboy is the only one that hails from Earth Prime. Now, in terms of the, de the I guess, the designation Superboy Prime, Infinite Crisis was the first time that he referred to himself as Superboy Prime. But in truth, the name Superboy Prime was first used in this story. So uh, that's why people started calling him Superboy Prime even before Infinite Crisis, uh, simply because of the fact that the name had already been given. It already been established by Elliot S. Magan. Now, uh, as we go through the story, one of the things we're going to find is how the story is written here versus some changes that Jeff Johns made in Infinite Crisis. And we'll talk about those once we get to Infinite Crisis. But what this does is this basically picks up with the destruction of Krypton. It's really a hallmark, a classic story of the Superman mythos. It's the one thing that doesn't change. Krypton always ends up being destroyed. Superman always ends up being sent from Krypton over to Earth. And that's really it. But with regards to Earth Prime, things are a little bit different here. For example, when Jor-El approaches the Science Council and says Krypton is doomed, he's not considered a quack. He's not considered a crazy person. The Science Council says, yes, you're right. We have to do something about this. Again, you know, Krypton's sun is basically on the verge of going supernova and it's on the verge of complete and total destruction, eliminating Krypton in its entirety. Now, the problem with this is that the Science Council is wanting to go the route of like logic and reason where they're like, we have to form other councils to sort this out and different things like that. But what jor is not telling them is that their time is extremely limited where they would form councils and they would take weeks, if not maybe a couple months in order to figure out what steps they need to take and then the time it takes to implement those steps, jor answer is, that, well, I guess really his knowledge is that they have less than a day. And so they're they're basically wrapping up insanely fast. Everything's coming to a halt extremely quick. Now, in truth, the reason why jor is doing this is to buy time. And the reason why is because with him and his wife having a child, the goal is to basically find a way to send their child away from Krypton in order to keep their kid alive. But in order to make sure that no one comes prying and, and, uh, and asking questions, all he really says is, is, look, you guys need to do whatever you need to do. I mean, we have to find a solution to this problem. But at the same time, like I'll be working on a solution at home, you know, what have you go, you guys go do your own thing. And so what we end up finding out is that where the process of Krypton Sun going supernova is affecting the planet in different ways. That's to say gravity kind of gravity waxes and wanes and different things like that. Instead of the traditional line of Kal-El in this universe being sent from Krypton on a ship, instead, it's actually a teleportation device. And that's what uh, Jor-El does. He basically approaches 
approaches the science castle and says, look, you know, I have a device that will transfer, that will transport anything under 50 pounds away to whatever location that we want. Now, what we have to do is basically expand on this technology so that we can teleport cities away, but we can use this to es essentially save our lives, you know, to keep our planet whole. Now, of course, because the science council had been dilly-dallying, in the end, this is just really a ruse. This is really just a way for, again, Jor-El to buy time so that his wife can place their son, or I guess he could really kind of get the science council out of there, but he and his wife can place, you know, Kal-El in this transportation device, this teleportation device, and whisk it away. Now, this is an inherent difference between the traditional Superman mythos and Superboy Prime. In the Superman mythos, you had like Argo City, right, which basically survived the entire experience, survived the entire ordeal, and that's where Supergirl comes from. In the Earth Prime universe, no one survived the destruction of Krypton. It's gone. It's completely history. And in addition to that, something else to point out is that in the regular Superman mythos, green kryptonite exists because when, you know, Krypton was destroyed, when its core went radioactive, or I guess when its core exploded, that it ended up leading to the planet literally just exploding and then shards of kryptonite flying throughout the universe, some of which eventually landed on Earth. Because of the fact that it's eradicated by a red sun, it's burned to a crisp, there's nothing left. And so what this means is there's no kryptonite in Earth Prime. That's one of the reasons why Superboy Prime is so wildly powerful in Infinite Crisis is because there's no kryptonite. One of the things that they established there, one of the things that we'll, we'll cover again once we get to that, is that kryptonite only works on the universe or only works on a Superman from that same universe. So kryptonite from Earth-1 works on Superman from Earth-1. Kryptonite from Earth-2 works on Superman from Earth-2, so on and so on. Kryptonite from Earth-1 will not work on Superman from Earth-2. And so because of this, it basically means that there's no counter to Superboy Prime. There's no genuine way to defeat him using traditional means to defeat Superman, which is why Jeff Johns invoked the Green Lanterns. And again, we'll get into that. That's why we're kind of rolling this into the Green Lantern mythos is because all of this really ties into like Green Lantern Corps and then going into Sinestro Corps War and all that kind of stuff. Superboy Prime is a huge part of that, but he's a character whose origin story and tales really kind of predate anything Jeff Johns did by quite some time. But the fact remains here that he's basically discovered by Naomi and Jerry Kent, which is actually, again, a total change from what we're used to. But more so than that, they end up naming him Clark Kent. But this is when we basically learn, or really it's, it's kind of reaffirmed that comic books exist on Earth Prime. Remember, this is basically our world. So when you're watching this video, you're watching this video on Superboy Prime, what DC basically says is that while you're on Earth Prime right now watching this video, there is a universe where the events of this video are happening. You know, there's a universe where Infinite Crisis happened. There's a universe where Superboy Prime exists. That's how it exists in this story. Superboy Prime is you. Superboy Prime is me. Like Superman exists only in comic book form. And so because of that, uh, he basically grows up without any powers whatsoever. He's just a normal person person. And again, that's a huge change here. Traditionally, uh, Superman growing up on Earth as Clark Kent was exposed to the yellow sun, his powers emerged at a very young age, and then from there, it was just going through his adolescence, learning to use his powers, encountering Lana Lang, who in turn taught him how to use his powers effectively, taught him what it meant to be a hero, whereby he eventually went on, traveled to Metropolis, met Lois Lane, fell in love, and the rest is history. And so because of that, Clark Kent, I, I guess Clark Kent as he exists now in terms of Superboy Prime, he maintains his name, uh, maintains his namesake of Clark Kent, but he has no power. He can be stabbed, he can be shot, he can be punched really hard and knocked out. He runs at the normal speed of a human being. He's as strong as a normal person, anybody his age. He is, for all intents and purposes, a regular person. Now, from here, this picks up with the introduction of a girl named Lori. And Lori is essentially a character, just this chick that he's kind of digging. But the reason the reason why this is so cool is because with, with Clark Kent growing up on Earth Prime and reading comic books, Superman was his favorite character. And so they essentially dress up to go to a, you know, a beach party, a Halloween party of sorts, kind of hanging out and doing their own thing. But what this does is it coincides with uh, both his love for for Superman, where he's dressed up as Superman, where he kind of acts out fantasies about being Superman, so on and so forth. But it also, you know, coincides with the arrival of Halley's Comet. Now, under normal circumstances, Halley's Comet shows up, I think like once every 75 years. It's a cool thing to see and nothing happens. In DC Comics on Earth Prime, Halley's Comet puts off a radiation of sorts. And what it does is it just sort of manifests in different ways. It causes, you know, all different kinds of weird impacts and things like that, but it also impacts like the gravity of Earth and things along those lines. But what it does is it essentially provides Superboy Prime with powers. Now, again, this is 1985, so we're not given these super in-depth explanations on why things happen. It's just Haley's Comet passes by, and now Superboy Prime has powers. You know, now Clark Kent from Earth Prime has superpowers. So what ends up happening here is, of course, you know, with him having these abilities, you know, he sees Haley's Comet, even though he shouldn't. This is when his, you know, 
telescopic vision kicks in. You know, he goes to touch it. This is when he starts to fly. And then he encounters Superman. Now, the reason why this happens is because of the fact that this takes place during the Crisis on Infinite Earths event. And this was really just a point in time when Superman, if I remember correctly, was just traveling around trying to find reinforcements. Now, the problem with this is the continuity that it fits into. In the realm of, of DC Comics, with Crisis on Infinite Earths, the whole point of the event was to basically eliminate the uh, multiverse and replace it with a singular universe. And that singular universe existed between the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths to the end of Infinite Crisis. For that 20 year period, there was only ever one universe in DC Comics. The problem with this was that the way the story progressed, shortly after the death of Supergirl, it was basically left to Superman of Earth 1 and Superman of Earth 2 to essentially fight off Anti-Monitor along with all the other heroes, which more or less saw his defeat until he reformed into the singular universe. The problem is that where this story, in terms of how this story fits in, it comes in after the death of Supergirl, which wouldn't make any sense because there wouldn't be an Earth Prime. There wouldn't be a multiverse. There would just be one universe. And that's the kind of continuity errors that I'm talking about that came out immediately after Crisis on Infinite Earths. But for the sake of the story, we can just take it at face value and just say, you know, for whatever reason, there is a, there's Earth Prime now, and that's where Superboy Prime comes from. But the fact remains here that within the confines of this story, Superboy Prime is meaning his idol. Remember, for him, Superman only ever existed in comic books. To suddenly encounter him and to find out that he's real is mind boggling. Not only that, because of the effects of Haley's comment, you know, because of all the things that are going on, there's a tidal wave that's coming in. And of course, Superman and Superboy Prime were able to basically stem this tidal wave, whisk it back into control, use their heat vision to more or less evaporate the water and save the day. And that's really it. But at this point, it's really just Superboy Prime hanging out with his idol. Now, one of the things that Elias, uh, Elliot S. Magan establishes here is that Superboy Prime is stronger than the standard Superman. He is, by all standards of measurement, stronger, faster, more capable. And so he's beyond the regular Superman. And that's one of the reasons why when Jeff Johns brought uh, Superboy Prime over into the uh, Infinite Crisis event, that he was so unstoppable. That's why Superboy Prime was able to take on the Doom Patrol, the Teen Titans, the Titans, and a couple members of the Justice Society of America all at the same time, because he's just such a strong, overpowered character. Like he really needed to be nerfed. It was wild how OP he was. That's why people loved him though, because man, man, let me tell you something, man, that fight, man, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited to cover that fight during Infinite Crisis because he's just, he's wrecking everyone. I mean, it's, it's hilarious because like, like Cassie Sands marks like, Hey guys, I brought in like the Doom Patrol and the Justice Society and some Titans and stuff. And Superboy Prime's like, man, son, you better come strong. It's one of the coolest things. It's one of the, God is, I'm hmm, fanboy. <laughs> I am so excited. I'm, I'm so hyped. I'm so hyped to do that story because it's one of the coolest things. But again, this is really just designed to kind of give us an interaction between the two. Now again, of course, because of the fact that this was not officially part of Crisis on Infinite Earths, it was just kind of tied in you know, later on down the line, what ended up happening here is that, uh, you know, it's really just Elliot S. Magan saying, hey, look, here's why Superman is here, because he crossed the dimensional barrier and he wasn't able to find a way back home. And so because of this, uh, it's really just kind of the reason for why he's here. But the fact remains that in the middle of this whole thing, Earth is basically, or at least it seems like it's going to be invaded, but it's actually visited by, you know, uh, really this, this group called the Arct Arct the Arcturus, I think it is. Like, I don't know. I'm Man, like this is 1980s comics, guys. Like my knowledge on this is scant at best when it comes to DC, but I'm pretty sure that's what they were. The Arcturus or Arcturus or something along those lines. But in the normal Superman universe, uh, they're basically like tourists, you know, in, in Earth One, they're basically tourists. They just kind of show up and they visit Earth and like they just run off with some stuff that seems weird to them. And that's really it, you know, for them to just kind of investigate and, and poke around. On Earth Prime, they're nefarious. They're actually bad guys. They're pretty villainous. Uh, the reason being because of the fact that in their mind, everybody who was on crypto should have been destroyed. But when they when they show up on Earth and they realize that Superboy Prime hails from Krypton on Earth Prime, that he's basically uh, somebody that's not supposed to be there. He's an anomaly. And so because of this, their goal is to essentially kidnap him and take him away for them to just kind of keep and hold on their own. Now, of course, Superman comes to the rescue and Superman essentially saves the day. But this is, again, another instance where Alien S. Magan establishes that Superboy Prime does not have the same sort of weaknesses that, that, uh, that Superman does. Now, this will be rectified by Jeff Johns. And the reason why is because what Superman does is he tells Superboy Prime, look, these guys, you know, are here and, and they, are kind, they are kind of nefarious. We have to fight them off because they're essentially going to try to cause problems on Earth, more or less. But what Superman does is he leads Superboy Prime to their central core, you know, where it is that all their power hails from. And of course, Superman goes on to explain that these guys, 
basically exist outside of the visual spectrum. So they seem invisible to anybody who can who, who looks at them, with the exception of Superman and Superboy Prime, because they have X-ray vision, you know, enhanced you know vision abilities and so on and so forth. But with inside this bubble, this sphere of energy is basically the power of a red sun. Superman cannot damage this bubble. Superboy Prime can punch right through it. And so what Elliot S. Magan is basically saying here is that Superboy Prime is not bound by the limitations of a red sun. That even if he's in the presence of a red sun, he can fly, he can do all the same things that Superman can do. The problem with this is that this takes away all conceivable weaknesses of Superboy Prime. Kryptonite doesn't exist, so he can't be taken out by Kryptonite. There's no red, no blue, no yellow, no green Kryptonite of any kind. He's not impacted by a red sun. He's stronger, faster, and more capable than any other Superman that exists inside the, the multiverse of DC Comics. He has no weaknesses. And so if Jeff Johns were to have rolled him over to inf into Infinite Crisis with the same power scale that he has now, he would literally just destroy everything. Like, no one would be able to stop him. And so that's why Jeff Johns more or less retconned this and threw in the red sun radiation as being a weakness for Superboy Prime. And so what this ends up doing is it basically just kind of allows them to transport over to Earth-1 and then things just sort of roll over into Infinite Crisis after this. I mean, there's really not, not a whole lot of a, a whole lot of discussion here. It pretty much wraps things up. I mean, it goes into like Superman's own little solo series, you know, but in terms of Superboy Prime, this is really just his origin. This is really where it all just kind of happens. I mean, he meets Superman, so on and so forth, but it's also establishing how powerful he is in relation to everybody else. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button and become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, Infinite Crisis is right around the corner. I'm hyped. I'm really excited about Infinite Crisis. It's such a good story and it fits so well into the Green Lantern mythos. Remember, after Infinite Crisis, we jump back into Green Lantern with uh, Green Lantern Core. And then I think we do like the origin of the Star Sapphires. And then we get into like, we start uh, setting the stage for the Sinestro Core War. But again, you know, the first two arcs of, of Jeff John's Green Lantern, for those of you guys who have been asking, because I've seen comments on Twitter, I've seen comments in the comment section or really questions in the comment section. For those of you guys who are asking the question, Jeff John's Green Lantern, you know, includes Green Lantern Core. It wasn't really written by him, but it's really kind of important to have Green Lantern Core. But the first volume of those, No Fear and uh, Green Lantern Core Recharge, basically give us the state of everything that's going on in the Green Lantern mythos. And then it just kind of grows from there. It's really just Jeff John's kind of building everything up. But yeah, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.